my Twitter fans in the crowd, thank you so much. Hello, OOW19, oh, excuse me, hashtag OOW19. So glad to be here, so glad for this uh, opportunity. Uh, thank you, Oracle, thank you, Code One, thank you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about this uh, topic which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, it's a four-letter word, and I use this four-letter word often, so I hope it doesn't offend you. The word is data. I talk about data a lot in my life, I use data a lot in my life. Uh, but. See where this starts. 49 years ago, imagine 49 years ago, oh my gosh, I can't even think that far back, but imagine 40, 49 years ago, a 15-year-old high school kid who had a vision and a dream to become an astronomer, an astrophysicist, ran across a book that was basically just ta tables and tables of tabulated data. Data giving the positions of the stars, the planets, the moons around the planets, the, the sun, the moon, all these things, eclipses, all these events, all tabulated when and where and how. And there was equations in the back of this book explaining how they derived these numbers. Well, I was just, probably my first real experience with data, like uh, hundreds of pages of numbers as a person who loved numbers and math to begin with, seeing all these numbers, seeing this data as sort of the basis of science was really inspiring to me. But then to see there were mathematical equations that were related to this, i.e. there were models related to the, that data. And crazy enough, my high school at that time, 1970, 1970, yes, that's how old I am, uh, got a connection with a 110 baud modem to the local university computer where we actually learned Fortran, and I learned how to code those equations, and for the first time in my life, I knew exactly the path that I was on. It was science, it was math, it was data, it was coding. And it hasn't really diverged much from that in 49 years. Now, yes, I've had a few jobs along the way. I, I work with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, I was an, uh, the archive project scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope at Johns Hopkins University for uh, 10 years. I worked at NASA as a contract manager, managing the astrophysics data system uh, for 10 years. I was professor of astrophysics and computational science, as mentioned, at George Mason University for 12 years. But guess what? During all those 12 years as professor of astrophysics, I never taught an astrophysics course. I taught data science. We, were, we started the world's first undergraduate data science degree program 13 years ago because the reason I left NASA and the reason we did that program is because it already became clear to me after two decades working at NASA with data, both as my day job and my night job as an astronomer, <laughs> you could see that data was not just growing astronomically in the sciences, but everywhere else in the world. And it, was, it became really clear that data was going to be the basis for every job, every profession. Every person needed to have some kind of aptitude, skill, or literacy around data. And I said, so I decided to leave my NASA position, I'll go to the university, and, and we formed this data science degree program to actually teach the next generation how to use data, what is data. And it was within a, it was within a computational science program where we taught coding along with that. So along the way, uh, more and more of my world diverged. I uh, started getting invitations to speak at conferences that, about things I knew very little about, like healthcare conferences, uh, national security conferences, uh, smart energy grid conferences around the world. And I said, what do I know about this stuff? I'm an astrophysicist, but I know data, and I know science, and I know modeling. And so it's your gateway to all kinds of different interesting opportunities in life. And so the, the emerging technologies I'm gonna to mention today, and, and, and the amount of time I have, I can't talk too much about any one of them individually, but at, at, at the core of all of those, those things is that four letter word, data. So we're gonna talk about that today, but in the context of, of this revolution that's going on right now. So you're probably familiar with this term, if not, I hope so, you, you will be now, and that is we are living through this fourth industrial revolution. Okay, so the, the earliest re uh, industrial revolution over 200 years ago based upon steam-powered engines. Okay, and then, we came, then electricity came along about 100 years later, and then of course the computer internet age, which we've all been part of, most of us, uh, for, for the last several years. And now it's really different, it's a different thing. It's not just about computing and internet, it's about the hyper-connectivity between everything, all things, and what is, what's connecting them is not just networks, but the flows of data and information that's shared to and from those things. Data that's produced by, informed by, driven by, 
the fuel for all these different technologies. So this fourth industrial revolution is truly changing work, future of work, careers, jobs, everything. So one thing that's interesting about this chart here uh, is it's, if we sort of think about sort of what's really changing in the workforce, the best uh, sort of singular example that you can trace back 200 plus years of a profession, and that's farming. So at the, at the beginning of the first industrial revolution in the 1780s, 90% of the US population worker, workforce, 90% of the workforce were farmers. Nine, zero, 90%. A hundred years later, at the start of the electricity boom, the second industrial revolution, about 50% of the US population was farmers. At the start of the computer age, in the last 50 years or so, 5% of the US population was farmers, and now less than a half percent of the US population workforce are farmers. Less than one half percent of the population who are now feeding 10 times more people than they were 200 years ago are doing the job that was the dominant position 200 years ago. And so every industrial age brings a transformation, not only of the technologies, but the work we do. So a really interesting stat came from the, uh, the World uh, uh, Economic Forum, yes, WF, World Economic Forum. Uh, they, they, they gave a few numbers about the changing workforce and some of the negative Naysayers, and I'm a, I'm a more of a positive spin person, the negative naysayers picked up one number in that report and said, wow, look at this. 75 million jobs will be lost as a result of AI and automation and, and these emerging technologies within the next five years. 75 million jobs will be lost. Isn't that terrible? But the very next sentence said, 133 million new jobs will be created. And I can do arithmetic, that's 58 million new positions that need to be filled. <laughs> Assuming we can translate to the 75 million to those other positions, which is just something I'm working on and a project I'm calling career relevance, because data and coding give you both career relevance and job security. <laughs> we heard in the, in the earlier little video clip there. Um, once you do that first line of code and see the results, you're addicted. Same thing with data science. I've done a lot of data science hackathons, and as soon as people see they can do stuff with those things called smartphones that are in their pockets already, every, every kid who entered my science class who declared to me they hated math and science became a lover of math and science after that class because they saw the power of what they can do. So we're really in this age, not just of an industrial revolution, but an innovation revolution, innovating new jobs, innovation of new work, innovation of new opportunities, and many of these opportunities, like I said, 58 million new ones that we have to figure out how we're going to find the people to do that. So this internet thing has been around a while, and I like to tell people, well, the internet used to be a thing, so now with the internet of things, what I like to say is things are now the internet. <laughs> okay, everything is on the internet. Of course, in the very early days of internet, people remember those days, people put their coffee on the internet. Anybody remember that? Thank you for waving. Yes, <laughs> people actually put their coffee, a, picture, a webcam in their coffee room to see how much coffee was in the urn. Okay, but literally we're putting sensors on everything, so things are now the internet. And I like to say that the value of this is not even sort of the obvious value, which is all the data being produced by and used by all these things, but it's the context that those sensors give us about the world. Because all those data streams are coming from something that's taking place at a, at a place and a time in a context at a location. So all this information gives you contextual knowledge about what's going on in that environment at that place where that sensor is. So literally, we're talking about the age of context now. Actually, there's a book on that right, right there on the screen. Okay, and another book I, I found recently, Outside Insight. How you can use these external data sources to even do better with all of the data you have. It's context everywhere, literally, <laughs> to infinity and beyond. So who are we? So who, we're here today at Code One, in this beautiful place. We're digital technology professionals entrusted with this data. We're entrusted with these digital assets from our firms, our businesses, organizations, our clients, whomever we're working with. And our mission through all this simply is to discover and deliver value from these data assets. Because as this guy said, without data, you're just another person with an opinion, right? 
So this is how I set our mission to discover and deliver value from data assets. It's a, a slightly shorter version of what Larry Allison said yesterday. But I wrote my slides before he said this yesterday, so I think we're in sync here. <laughs> he said that our mission, speaking of Oracle, our mission is to help people see data in new ways, discover insights, and unlock endless opportunities. So I'm here to talk about seeing your data in new ways and discover insights. And some of those new te technologies, which I'll mention briefly, you'll know, we'll see a, a bunch of them fly by in the, in the remaining minutes here. Uh, those will be chances for us to unlock these endless opportunities. So this is an eye chart. Don't try to read everything on that slide. But I just call this my expanding frontier of emerging technology. So if you could read all this, you would see things like AI, 5G, drones, robotics, deep learning, virtual assistance, machine learning, virtual reality, augmented reality, and on and on it goes, okay? All getting, getting down towards the bottom, we get autonomous vehicles, quantum computing, computer vision, digital twins, blockchain. So we got this expanding frontier of new emerging technologies. Some have been around for a while, some yet to come, like quantum computing. But I'd like to say a lot of these things probably I wouldn't say necessarily 100 percent, but probably 99 percent of these things are inspired by data, informed by data, that is, it's the fuel that comes in. It's enabled by data and it allows us to create value from data. So what do we do with all the data we're collecting, which is an enormous quantity? We're we're, our mission, again, is to create value from all of that. So value is achieved when you take that data and get something out of it, a decision, an action, a product. Okay, we're, we're, that's, that's where you get value, not just holding the data. In the early days of the big data hype revolution, uh, which is like almost seven years ago now, maybe more than seven years ago now, the start of the big data hype revolution, people would go to conferences and brag about how much big data they have. All right, and then I would get up and speak, and, and I would talk about this uh, Excel spreadsheet that I had with uh, 26 columns and a couple thousand rows, and they said, well, that's not big data. <laughs> I said, yes, but there's 26 factorial ways that my students were investigating the relationships between those 3,000 galaxies and these 26 physical parameters. And if, they spent my, if, if my students spent one second on each one of those 26 factorial combinations, evaluating it for principal components and clustering analysis and outliers and all kinds of things, if they spent one second per combination of those, it would take them 10 to the 9 lifetimes of the universe to analyze all of that data. So even a simple little spreadsheet can be big data. Okay. So it's not about volume, it's about the big value you can extract from it. So there's sort of three broad categories of discovery from data, that is data science and AI applications uh, that we, we use uh, data for. Image understanding, language understanding, and next best action understanding or decision making. And as you might See there, uh, a lot of these words have sort of uh, an anthropomorphic under, uh, meaning to them. And not too surprisingly, because when we're training our AI, when we're collecting data, we are emulating exactly what the eyes, the ears, the brain, everything that we have is already doing. It's receiving sensory inputs from our world and making decisions about the next best action, next best thing to do from that input. And that's what we, we're trying to achieve here, is that cognitive power in our autonomous systems that we already naturally have as human beings. So those three broad categories are how we bring data to action. So it's really about connecting the dots, all right? So data itself just bunches of ones and zeros, but when we start seeing those relationships, so we start examining those combinations of the data where cool things happen. Okay, so people who bought that book also like this book. People who watch that movie also like this movie. We, hear, we know about recommender engines. It's about connecting the dots in that space of data to make decisions and take actions and deliver value. Okay, so there's a very large company out there in the world, one of the largest companies in the world, who has recommender engines. You probably know them by a name. <laughs> uh, that, that particular com company, nearly a trillion dollar business, a full 30% from, my, from what I've been read, reading, full 30% of the revenue of that trillion dollar business is from the recommender engine. Think about that for a second. 30% of the revenue of a trillion dollar business comes from a machine learning algorithm. <laughs> yeah, wow, <laughs> See, I can read your lips. <laughs> That's taking data to insights to action. 
Okay, that, so AI to me is not artificial intelligence, and I have a slide about this later on. There's nothing artificial about it. It's really augmented intelligence, accelerated intelligence, actionable intelligence. It's all these things that give us value from our data. So really what I'm saying is about look at, look at the connectivity and remember again, the fourth industrial revolution is about that hyper connectivity. The connectivity, not only in our data sets, but even among the technologies. And that's really what I'm looking at today is that when we start bringing together 5G and AI and IoT and autonomous vehicles and digital twins and blockchain and whatever, we start bringing these things together, we start building new and interesting products that no one ever imagined before. And if there was 26 things on my list of emerging technologies earlier, and I think there was about 26, there's 26 factorial ways to combine them. And if you spend one second combining each one of those and create a product for your company, you'll have a new product every second for the next 10 to the nine lifetimes of the universe. So get, get busy, folks. Okay. But Leonardo da Vinci said it best several centuries ago. He said, learn how to see, because how we see is we not just see tunnel vision, we see the context around it. Okay, we realize that everything is connected to everything else. And so it's starting to find the connections between those technologies and those data sets and all those different combinations that will start delivering the value uh, in, in, in newer and more innovative ways than ever before. So yeah, autonomous vehicles are great, blockchain is great, 5G is great, you know, all kinds of things are great, augmented reality, virtual reality, drones, you name it, all kinds of cool things. But imagine start, that you start combining those things in different ways, what, what kind of products you can generate. So the number of combinations and interactions in this graph is really big. As a little intelligent student says there, how big? <laughs> Very big. <laughs> it's a combinatorial explosion. So people talk about the ex exponential growth of stuff. Well, I got, I got three curves on this, what I call my holy shoot graph. I think you read the axis there, it's my holy shoot graph. There's a linear growth curve, which is like two times X. There's an exponential growth curve, which is like two to the X power. And there's a combinatorial growth curve, which is like X to the X. Uh, that's uh, quite a bit faster than the other ones. So when people say things are growing exponentially, said, dad, that slowly? <laughs> that's pretty slow, actually. <laughs> combinatorial growth is blowing away everything. All right. So what kind of things are we talking about here? Okay, let's get cut to the chase here. Okay, there, I, I put discovery from data, that is data science, in sort of four broad categories. I mean, it doesn't capture everything, but sort of the four broad categories. So we got class discovery, that is discovering the segments, the clusters in the population, subpopulation, subsegments. Okay, so that, uh, so that diagram in the upper left uh, where you see data clouds DC1, 2, and 3, data clusters 1, 2, and 3, in a three-dimensional parameter space, P1, P2, P3. That's just made up synthetic data just to illustrate clusters. So we've got three clusters, dominant clusters in there, and there we see a few more. All right, so at, with, in class discovery, not only discovered the, the dominant classes, but we just start discovering as we add more data, the value of adding more data here, we start seeing other clusters emerge other segments in our population. So these might be populations of clusters. They may be segments of behavior of a machine. They may be segments of uh, the, the pathway of a, of a medical diagnosis or a drug treatment. Okay, so all these clusters are, are, are segments of some population. And as you add more data, you start discovering more of those segments. But the most interesting thing about this, what, what you discover here also to me is, is you learn the boundaries that separate them. All right, what makes data cloud two different from data cloud three? So if data cloud two is a certain diagnosis for a disease given a set of, of diagnostic measurements, P1, P2, P3, it's, it, if you have been diagnosed with data uh, diagnosis two, and your lab results put you right near the boundary of data cloud two and data cloud three, that is diagnosis two and data diagnosis three, if your, if your lab results put you real close to that boundary, you know you have a very strong chance of a false positive or a false negative because you're very close to a boundary to a new class. But if you're smack dab in the middle of data cloud one, that is diagnosis one, you can probably be fairly certain that's what it is. Okay, so learning not only the segments of the population, but what distinguishes them is the real beautiful power of all this data. So class discovery is one thing. And oh, by the way, my astronomy friends like to call this the banana diagram, because data cloud two looks like a banana. All right, but I'd just like to call it the peanut, banana, and potato diagram, personally. Anyway, so the second thing we can do with our data is correlation discovery. All right, so that's, that's sometimes called predictive power discovery. When you see X correlates with Y, okay, then X becomes a surrogate for Y. So given X, we can figure out what Y will be. Okay, that's sort of, that's predictive analytics. That's predictive power discovery. 
But as we add more dimensions beyond X and Y, so X and Y are two dimensions, if we start adding more dimensions, you start getting insights. Well, that's good. We have a three-dimensional plot here, so I got more than two dimensions. Good. <laughs> okay. So the third dimension starts giving you insight. That is, we see this data cloud two, for example, it has a certain slope in that correlation in data cloud two between parameters one and three, and that slope, that correlation strengthens at a certain place. It's a weak correlation, then it becomes a stronger correlation at some point later on. Well, if you just have parameters one and three, and you just see that it changes at a certain point, you really don't have any sort of causal information. You don't have any contextual information. Remember the internet context, remember? We don't have any contextual information as to why it's happening at that point, in that elbow. Why is it changing there? I can tell you that it is changing there. I can build a predictive model and say it'll change there, but I don't understand why. But if we start looking at our other data sources, hopefully other data sources will give us some contextual information and maybe even some causal information. For example, P2 might be a variable, a feature in your data set over which you have some control. Okay, it might be a marketing campaign, a discount on a product. It might be you know, uh, the temperature setting on an engine. It might be something you have control over. So even though you might predict a certain thing is going to change, if you can adjust that parameter, you know that you can move P th the, the P3 response function in any direction you want, further down or further up. That now becomes prescriptive power discovery. So a correlation analysis can lead to causality discovery if you have multiple dimensions, some of which are causal variables, that is conditions under which you have some control. So predictive maintenance on engines, for example, is a great uh, an example of applying AI and machine learning uh, to manufacturing or, or machines or, or jet aircraft engines or whatever, which I, it's nice to know since I'm flying home this evening. <laughs> they do these predictive maintenance on the engines. And if you, if you predict that the engine is going to fail at 2 o'clock tomorrow morning en route uh, from San Francisco to Baltimore, I'm, uh, I'm going to be kind of unhappy that, that, that they didn't take that plane out of service. Okay, so, so just like if your doctor says, well, I diagnosed you with cancer and you're going to die tomorrow, have a nice day, I'll send you my bill, you, you're going to say, wait a minute, can't you do something, doctor? <laughs> can't you do something? Oh, yeah, I can give you a prescription. So prescriptive maintenance, prescriptive analytics, prescriptions are about doing that thing that you know based upon your data, clinical studies in the, in the case of medicine, but in the case of our data systems, finding those contextual causal variables. What can I do to change the outcome? I want a better outcome. I want a different outcome. So predictive modeling says given X, find Y. Okay, I see a correlation of X versus Y. Given an X, I can tell you Y. Prescriptive analytics is the exact opposite. Given Y, find X. Here's what I want it to be. What can I do to get it there? Or I don't want it up there. I want it down here. If, depending upon I want something, that variable to have a different outcome, what do I need to do to change in my causal contextual environment to produce the outcome I want? That's a prescription. Okay, so again, predictive analytics, given X, find Y. Prescriptive analytics, given Y, find X. Now, I've had a few decades of mathematics, several semesters of calculus to get, to get to a physics degree. You don't need all that to realize that given x, find y, and given y, find x are really sort of opposite mathematical statements, okay? They really are opposite things. But they, they all derive from finding those correlations in your data, especially when you have the higher dimensions. And so what you're really discovering is how that system behaves under different circumstances. How does it evolve? How does it respond? What does it look like? That's called the object's DNA. So all that data is giving you the object's DNA. Okay, so that's two. Number three is outlier detection. It sort of speaks for itself, except it doesn't. Because my friend who put together this banana diagram did something really clever. Can you see from your seat in the middle of data cloud two, the lower section of data cloud two, there's a little blue shaped, sort of heart shaped thing there. Can you see that? The lower port of data cloud two, there's a little blue Smudge there, sort of heart shape, kidney shape. That was intentional. That's not a smudge on the screen. That was intentional. That's meant to represent a void. It's a region that the data avoids that region. Now, in astronomy, we have lots of examples like that. And when we find those things, it tells us there's some physical law, there's some astrophysical reason why that thing in nature doesn't want to be in that spot. And so when you discover those voids, it's an aha moment. It's a discovery moment. It says, what is it about the system that's telling me that it can never be there? Okay, so an outlier can sometimes be right smack dab in the middle of your data set, and yet it shouldn't be there. That's an inlier. And it's just as interesting and surprising and anomalous and novel as the outlier who's sitting, you know, seven standard deviations from the mean. 
So an, a, an inlier can be zero standard deviations from the mean and still be extremely interesting discovery. So surprise discovery number three. And then when we get to number four here, it, it's the fourth one deserves its own little uh, cartoon of its own down at the bottom left there, and that's a link discovery, network analysis. Okay, discovering interesting associations and links, just like the product recommender engines, or, or even like marketing attribution, or, or fraud detection, because it's not A communicates to C, but A communicates to C through B. Okay, so marketing attribution is just like that. Uh, illicit money transfers is just like that. It goes A to B, B to C, because if it was A to C, someone would notice and they would get arrested. Okay, okay so it's the hops in the graph and the, and the, and the dots that are not connected that, uh, directly, but transitively through other, uh, through other nodes in, in the graph. That, that's the, where the real discovery happens. So associated link discovery is another great way of discovering value in your data. Okay, so all those different ways of discovery can be applied at different levels of analytics maturity. Okay, so these levels listed here are, in a sense, orthogonal to the things on the previous slide. That is, you can do all the things on the previous slide at some, in some way or another at, at each of these different levels here. So there are different ways of describing what we're doing. So the analytics are the outputs, the outcomes, the, the delivered value from all the stuff we're doing, all the data science we're doing, all the discovery we're doing from our data. So what are some of those things? Well, number one is descriptive analytics. You can produce a report and say what happened. All right, now that's, that may seem kind of boring because it's a historical hindsight what happened type of thing. But if you're in a publicly traded company, which I am and Oracle is, <laughs> you, know, you know you have to do quarterly business reports for, for Wall Street. It's required by law. So descriptive reports are in, invaluable and keep you out of jail. <laughs> okay. So even though it might be at the lowest rung in this at maturity ladder, uh, it's still absolutely essential in some settings. So what you're doing in descriptive analytics is you're answering the prescribed questions. You're answering the questions given to you. You'll see when we get to number five here, I'll sort of jump to, to the gun here. Number one, you're answering the prescribed questions, and number five in cognitive analytics, you're discovering the questions you should be asking. That's the fully human cognitive role or, anal or analogy for analytics, which is you look at your data and say, why is that happening? Why is that outlier there? Why is there this void here? Why is this trend suddenly changing slope? Why did this change under this condition, but it didn't change there? You know, what is this new emerging subcluster in, in my medical data or in my customer data? All those questions, don't avoid them. Embrace them. And sometimes the question may come from the most junior person on your staff, and it may even come uh, from a family member because you're pre preparing your presentation for the Oracle Code 1 stage, and you show it to your family before you leave home, and the youngest member of the family who's six years old said, what's that? My grandkids call me Poppy. What's that, Poppy? <laughs> well, that, that didn't actually happen, but it did happen years ago with my, when my kids were that age. <laughs> okay, so let anybody look at your data because they will see things that maybe you didn't see. So, it's, so cognitive analytics is that highest level. Now find me the questions you should be asking from your data. But along the way, we're doing these things, and I give them these funny words, hindsight, oversight, foresight, insight, and then finally I had to come up with something that rhymes with sight, so right sight. <laughs> okay. So hindsight, that's descriptive. Diagnostics is oversight, that's sort of real-time analytics, what's happening right now. Predictive analytics, we already talked about what will happen, that's foresight, look, sort of seeing the future forecasting, prescriptive analytics, that comes from the insight we talked about. Given all these other data sources and these other dimensions of the data, we have insight into how our system behaves in ways we never saw before because we have all this contextual data now. So insight discovery enables us to prescribe better outcomes, what, how to optimize outcomes, choose the next best action, make the next best decision given our data. So that's prescriptive analytics. And then cognitive analytics is, again, having that full view of things where you say, what is it, what is it that I should be doing? What is the question I should be asking? What is the right thing to do right now in, the, in, the right, in this context at this, at this point? So it moves, cognitive analytics moves beyond just answering the given questions, but generating new questions from your data. So those are the things we do with our data. So, the, so we, we produce value by applying algorithms to data, discovering patterns, and building models from them. So that's taking us through machine learning and data science actionalizing it, which might be the AI, and then the products of those things are the analytics. So that, all that terminology is defined here on the screen. There's a couple of things besides the, the busy definitions there that I want to call your attention to. First, the very top line of the top two lines of the slide, it says, learning is an iterative process, right? You learn fast, 
fail fast to learn fast. We know that, right? The best way to learn something is to make mistakes and learn from it, learn from your mistakes. So learning is an iterative process. Science is an iterative process. So scientists develop hypotheses, they test them, some, and they, they do experiments to test them, and sometimes it doesn't work so well, so you refine the hypothesis and you try again. So it's an iterative process. So if learning and, is, and science are both iterative processes, it's not too surprising that machine learning and data science ought to be iterative processes also. So, but, so machine learning are these algorithms that learn through that process of failing, that learns from experience, just like a child learns from experience, right? So the best line I ever heard for that describes uh, machine learning also applies to raising teenagers, right? <laughs> Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. <laughs> so when you build a model, you build a rough model, and of course it's going to be wrong. And we have things like gradient descent and back propagation and all these cool techniques in machine learning that feed the error information back to the model to adjust it to make it better. It's algorithms that learn from experience. Just mathematics is all it is. Data mining is how we apply that to data to do discovery. AI is how we apply that data to taking actions. Data science then is the scientific methodology that we apply to do all that all the different pieces of science, hypothesis, generation, experimentation, data collection, validation, refinement, all those things. That's the process, that's the, that's the methodology where we use the math to, de to fi build models that we, that we test to deploy, and then when we deploy it, we actually then have the analytics. That's, that's a deployed thing. And so the second quote I wanted to draw your attention to, besides all the definitions in the top line, was the thing in the yellow, yellow box on the right. That is the two most important things in data science. So if, if you remember anything else today before you leave <laughs> and after you leave, the two most important things in data science are the data and the science. Because <laughs> okay? the data are the raw objective truth, the raw objective reality, the fuel for our models. And science is the methodology by which we don't get, we hopefully don't trap ourselves into confirmation bias. Oh, that model worked. Test it, verify it, put it through some paces, uh, try it on a different data set, see if it generalizes. So don't get stuck in a bias trap. All right, it's, it's an iterative process, and, and it's okay to be wrong first. Okay, so Thomas Edison, you know, he, he, he was, someone complained to Thomas Edison, you know, that he failed a thousand times to, to invent the light, the light bulb. And he said, I didn't fail a thousand times, I learned a thousand ways not to build a light bulb. Okay, so, so failing fast to learn fast is, is an adoptable uh, good practice in business. So analytics by design basically goes back uh, to my last point on the la on the, at the very bottom of that last slide, which is analytics are the products. We need to focus on our business outcomes, our goals, our objectives. What is your mission? What is your north star of your business? You know, that, that should be de de determining what you do, where you go, and how you go there. All right, some people say they're data-first organizations. I'm not going to complain if, that, if that, that's uh, a way you want to describe it, but I don't like using that phrase because every organization has data now. That doesn't distinguish you from anybody. Just like years ago, people would brag about how big their data sets were. And that, doesn't dis that doesn't separate you, make you uh, distinguishable in the marketplace. What distinguishes you are your output, your products, the, the delivered value from your data. That's the analytics. So focus on what it is we want to accomplish, what are, what are our business questions, and that's a good science practice too. Good science starts with asking a question, a hypothesis, what, what, am I, what am I looking for? What am I, how do, an hypothesis that explains this thing that I see. Okay, test it, verify it, go through a process. So analytics first is good business strategy. It focuses on, the, on outcomes which matter, and also it focuses on products, which are, the, which are the value that we create from our data. And as you build products that are in, increasingly successful, and it may start with some very, very small things like a very simple recommender engine or a very simple chatbot that very simply is plugged into your customer service call center, and answers the, the FAQs for people. Because like 80% of the questions that people call for call centers are just in the FAQs which are already posted on your website. But people don't read anymore, so they, they call the call center, call center people are frustrated because it's the same old questions and it's right there on the website, people. So you can actually have an API, call a chatbot, feed it your FAQs and you're done. No coding, no work involved, <laughs> basically. And you, you've just solved 80% of your customer service calls but not only that, you've made your employees really happy. Because the last thing an employee likes to do is answer the same question over and over and over and over and over again. So you're improving employee experience, which therefore translates into better customer experience. You know, happy employee, happy customer. You, you see the equation there, right? Okay, so, so by focusing on those small victories, you, then you encourage the culture to accept larger 
larger projects around AI and machine learning. Because there's a lot of fear in the marketplace and in businesses and companies and organizations everywhere. Uh, people fear job loss. But every, at every tier of the, of the organization, people think, you know, someone's going to do my work or someone's going to do my decision making or someone's going to run the company. I mean, so everyone thinks that they're not <laughs> going to have a place anymore. And that's true. The jobs will change. But we'll need more people for the new jobs. So let's deliver value, and that'll inspire the culture change that'll lead us to those bigger implementations. So at the end of the day, this analytics by design means think about the products we want to deliver that are going to deliver the value, and there's some there at the bottom of the slide there. Uh, I ran out of room, I got the dot, dot, dot there, because I put the word models in my original slide about seven times in this place, because the models really, to me, are the, are the key thing. It's the models of how customers behave, how your systems behave, how your website behaves, how your database behaves, how your, anything behaves, right? So those models become sort of the, the fuel, the, the engine uh, that is driven by the fuel, which is the data, which leads to the output, which are uh, the... Uh, the analytic products. So what's going on in that engine? What's going on in this in machine learning engine? We talked about algorithms that learn from experience. Okay, that sounds pretty damn vague, really. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, again, uh, they, they learn from patterns and data what something will do or how something will behave. So just like I always say, like the first caveman comes out of the cave and they see this animal in front of them, they have to, uh, first of all, they, they have to do object recognition. They recognize it's an animal and not a bush. <laughs> okay. okay, so there's object recognition. Okay, so pattern recognition or pattern detection, I should say, pattern detection. Then they do recognition. They have to recognize, is this something going to eat me for lunch or can I eat it for lunch? So either way, if you make the wrong decision, your day is over, okay, your, your life's over. Okay, so it's clear that we need to learn from experience. And so supervised learning is given the training data, given past data, labeled data, how can we get a, an algorithm that, that, that can detect, for example, a cancer or a failing engine or a cancer patient or an unhappy customer or whatever? Okay, so we, lear, we learn from feedback, from labeled data, from prior experience, historical data, training data, and build the model so we can deliver a better outcome, and that's called supervised learning. It's, it's given past experience, we know how to deliver better. Then there's this thing called unsupervised learning, where you basically say, what patterns do I see in the data, independent of what my biases might be about what I'm looking for? Okay, so I might see these new clusters emerging, these new patterns emerging, these new trends, these outliers, these inliers, these new links in the graph, the social graph, the, the product graph, the knowledge graph, all right? It's unsupervised, it's data-driven, okay? It's finding things in the data in a sense that the six-year-old can find. All right, what's that? Why is this? All right, asking those questions, finding that hidden structure that you didn't previously know about, un unsupervised learning. So it doesn't necessarily require labels, okay? So you're looking at a, a radiological image to see if a patient has cancer and there's some funny little smudge over here on the lung. Well, would you like for your doctor to ignore that and say, okay, you don't have cancer, bye should have paid attention to this thing over here, okay? Because that might be something serious. Okay, so, and so the, the third kind of machine learning is reinforcement learning, and that's how the machines learn how to play chess and go and beat the world champions. Okay, they play the game with a reward uh, stated. What, what's the reward? You know, what, what's this, how well am I doing? There's a score, there's feedback, and that reward process trains the machine how to do better. It says, okay, if I do this, I get worse, or if I do that, I get better. So that reinforcement learning is a, is a very significant iterative process. Okay, and that's really powerful for uh, decision-making in autonomous systems because it's learning uh, rapidly you know, from its experience. So traditional programming, this is oversimplification, don't get in an argument with me about this uh, because it's not my slide, but I actually do believe this slide. So traditional programming, right, is you write a program and you give it some input and it generates an output. That's sort of what I did back in my high school days. I, I, I had these positions of the planets on the sky. I, I put it in a program and I could generate those numbers. It was, I was amazed I could generate the predicted positions of the, of the moons and the planets just from what I was doing right there. Traditional uh, uh, programming like that. So supervised machine learning, I'm going to emphasize supervised because that's specifically in this case. We have the data, we have the input data, 
we have the, we have the labels, that is, these images represent pa patients who have cancer, these images represent patients who don't, or this time series represents an engine that has normal behavior, this represents an engine that has uh, a, a, a malfunction that's about to happen or will happen soon. Uh, you know, this data predicts happy customer, this data predicts unhappy customer. Think about sentiment analysis, right? So we have data and we have output. We know what the outcome will be. Then we find the model, we find the program that reproduces the data and the output. Okay, so we're, what we're looking for is the program, the model that will generate from the input the desired output. Then we apply that to our new data. Okay, so the top level of this plot where you see the blue arrows, it's how we have training data coming in we extract interesting features of the data to generate a model, an algorithm from machine learning, whether it's class discovery, correlation discovery, novelty discovery, link discovery, whatever, whichever we're doing. And we build a model that can produce correctly those outputs, we correctly label a cancer image, correctly label a, an unhappy customer, correctly label uh, an engine that's malfunctioning. Then, once you have that output, again, the output is the program, then you can apply that program to new data. So then you get sort of to the more traditional input program output. Okay, you feed the new data through the model and generate the output. That is, you predict the, the class variable, cancer, no cancer, engine fail, not fail, happy customer, unhappy, whatever. All right, so you apply the model, that's where the green arrows are. But remember this famous quote from this, uh, the statistician that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So don't get stuck with analysis paralysis saying, well, this is, you know, this is not entirely correct. Remember the 80-20 rule, right? I mean, 80% of the value comes from the first 20% of effort. Okay, so you can get that 80% of value in your first 20% of effort. Sometimes you don't need to spend all that extra effort, five times more effort, just to get the last 20%. All right, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Sometimes the simplest models are the best, and I can tell stories about those, which I don't have time to do today. Anyway, so this rapidly expanding frontier, there's some examples which follow. There's a link to the slides at the end where you can read all these things in gory detail. I don't have the time this afternoon to read through all these for you. But machine learning, okay, so uh, there's like nine or 10 things from that previous slide that I'm gonna just f fly through here. So machine learning algorithms that learn from experience, for example, recommender engines, uh, digit detection at the, at, the, at the post office so it can read the zip code on, on your letters, uh, uh, spam email detection, uh, cancer detection, I talked about those. So, so these are algorithms that are trained from historical data to learn how to label things correctly, models that can learn how to get things right. So AI, that actionable intelligence, that accelerated, augmented, assisted intelligence, augmenting the human in the loop, nothing artificial about that, bringing data to action, those applications well, for the first four are the ones that were just on the previous slide. The algorithms and models that we learn, that's just mathematics and coding. Now we apply it, that's the AI. So those first four, one through four, my example says, as it says there, examples one through four of the uh, applications you just saw. Other examples include credit card fraud alert and conversational AIs, you know, the, the Siri, Alexa, chatbots, and so on. Uh, robotics, we know about that. Okay, so robo robots respond to sensory inputs to move through their environments. That's a data input, you know, decision output, action output, based upon data, 3D printing. Uh, now this, seem, this may seem kind of boring, because 3D printing, you sort of have to build a model of the thing, uh, and then you feed the model into the printer and it prints it out. That's called additive manufacturing. It may not seem too interesting, but 4D printing is really the, the wave that's coming, where the system can, for example, using carbon nanotubes, it can actually respond to sensory input and change shape in real time. So uh, medical doctors are using uh, carbon nanotube heart stents that they implant in the patients with a sensor, a heart monitor, blood pressure, and, and uh, various sensors in the body. And when that patient and is going through some stressful moment or has a sudden heart fibrillation or higher blood pressure or, or body temperature change or something, the, the shape of the heart stent will change in real time in their body in response to those sensory inputs. That's 4D printing. It's changing in space and time in response to input data in the body without further surgery. That's insane, there's a, here's a YouTube, you can read about this. All right, virtual reality, again, it, it's a virtual environment, but a lot of times there's sensory inputs and sensory motions that make the, the reality experience real because it's actually detecting all that from sensors. Augmented reality is when you now have data superimposed on the real world. So whether you're in the shopping mall and you say, where are the sales? Or, or I go into the grocery store, where are the Cheerios? <laughs> okay, so I could, I could have that augmented reality right there on my phone. 
So it shows me my store with labels on it, or it might be a disaster response showing where there's down power lines or patients or people in most distress, okay? Or other kinds of things. Or there's augmented reality of this app where you actually can stand in front of a mirror in a store, try on an, a new outfit without trying it on. Stay in your own clothes, select the, 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 the clothes you want to see how you look in it, and it just shows you in the mirror with those clothes on without you actually having changed anything. <laughs> okay. Pretty amazing. Okay, IoT, I already talked about that. It's day to day to everywhere generating uh, fuel from these sensors to all, of all, all kinds of uh, things. Autonomous vehicles, we don't need to talk about that at length. We know about that. I, obviously, sensory inputs, deriving, a literally d driving actions, literally. Drones, similar sort of thing. Sensory detection, whether it's for disaster response, military ac applications. Our, our construction sites or just for fun or whatever, uh, sensory d data uh, analyzed by algorithms to say what's going on. All these things are examples of dynamic data-driven application systems, okay? So all these things are doing measurement from sensors of all kinds. It's doing inference that is building a model of how I think this thing is behaving, building a prediction to say, if I do this, this will happen, or this is likely to happen. So it's both predictive and prescriptive, actually. And then the last part is this S called the steering. That is the actual action taking. An autonomous system who now takes an action based upon this chain of events. I, I measure something from sensors everywhere. I infer something from it. I, throw, I, I make a decision. Okay, so, this, so decision is really a prescriptive analytic process. If I decide to do this, this might happen. If I decide to do that, that might happen. That's, that's what happens in boardrooms every day. It's a prescriptive discussion. If we do this, what will happen? If we do that, what will happen? So you, you go through that process, that inference from your data, data-driven. That's why this slide is about dynamic data-driven systems. These, then you can have an autonomous system anywhere in the world, including in your database. <laughs> Which brings us to the autonomous database at Oracle. But I, I talked to Nat, uh, NASA folks for years, long before anyone had a vision of autonomous databases, of how can we use AI or how can we use data science for data science? Using data science to label data. Use AI to create tags, semantics, taxonomies, descriptions, indices, organizations of our data. Imagine a, a, li a library. Imagine walking into a library. For, people remember what libraries were? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> Mostly people with gray hair. Anyway, so, so you're in a library. The books are organized by, alphabetically by the third letter of their middle name, right? No, they're organized by the Dewey Decimal System, so you know how to find something. There's a system, they're indexed in a certain way. But imagine if you walked in that library and it, the index suddenly changed based upon your preferences and your interests and the things that you like. And suddenly it's all organized according to your personal preference. Your personal interests. Like, I actually, like, suppose I like cooking in the mountains, so I want some outdoors books next to some cooking books. But I, I want to do it under the stars. I'm an astronomer, so I want it next to the astronomy books. Okay, so the, the whole system organizes the data and presents it to me based upon my digital breadcrumbs, things that I have already done with data, how have I used the data, how have I found interesting things in the data. Even digital breadcrumbs that can, can identify friction points where the the person constantly keeps trying and then doesn't have success. That's a, you can detect that in the data. So adding data to data, using data science for data science to make our data systems more useful for the data applications we've talked about. So truly, it's a data world after all. Data really helps our world go around. And let's not forget what Larry Ellison said, that our mission is to help people see data in new ways, discover insights, and unlock these endless possibities. So thank you very much. Come for the data, stay for the science.